Sure. So, uh, hello everyone and uh, welcome to my Polish desktop talk. Uh, my name is Lavent Uh I'm from Hungary and um, I'm a Fedora project ambassador and I, I'm also a software engineer and intern on the virtualization team at Red Hat in Brno, Czech Republic, where it's a lot more hotter than here at least. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about some blockers, uh, about Linux desktop and layer of Linux desktop. So before we ask, I wanted to ask a question like who here has heard the phrase next year or this year will be the year of Linux desktop? Raise your hands, right. So I, I, must, I assume you're familiar with this thing and some of you may be familiar with this and even this, I don't know. Like, this has been going on for years and um, yeah, that's how it goes. Uh, every year has been the layer of the Linux desktop and everybody was thinking that the next year will be even better and that's it. So I just wanted to give myself a little bit of an introduction. Like, who am I? What I do? I'm 90 years old. I'm a computer hacker. I work in everything uh, with regards to computers and software most of the time. Uh, I have been an intern at Red Hat last summer and this summer as well, both working on the virtualization team, uh, trying to make KVM and other things work. Uh, and I'm trying to make them work properly. Uh, I'm also a Fedora project ambassador. My mentor was Sultan Hofer, who's sitting here. And uh, he will be giving a Git talk, just an advertisement. He's going to be giving a Git talk about Fedora ambassador mentoring later today. Uh, in my spare time and the uh, internship at Red Hat, I'm also working on the Linux kernel, uh, which is one of the main antagonists in why the Linux kernel will not be, the Linux desktop will not be successful soon. And uh, I'm not just only working on the Linux kernel, I'm also working some on some low level things like code borders, and I even worked on my own Linux kernel cloning thing that wasn't very successful because you couldn't run Doom on it, but it doesn't matter. Uh, I also, currently I consult a company in Canada that works on Android open source project and I actually have some uh, weird, I actually like it for it, that's the weird thing I do. Um, so my goal to this talk is uh, to share my experiences as an ambassador and uh, that's because I visited conferences, I talked to people and they talked with me and um, some people are just, you know, they're trying out new Linux distributions. They come to Linux conferences or even open source conferences because they actually want to try out a Linux distribution. Um, they sometimes get to the Fedora booth and they want to find out why Fedora is suited for a desktop and why, why, why is it better than the other desktops that you book to or, or SUSE or something like that. Um, and then um, I have some experiences that I wanted to share. Like what, what do they expect? What are the problems? And what they don't like? And what should they like? What do they like? And I personally believe the Linux desktop right now is broken. It's not the way it should be. And Windows as a desktop operating system is better than the Linux desktop. I know I'm going to get killed for that, but my opinion. And um, yeah. So we're going to talk about why why I think it is broken and uh, we'll see. Of course there's some question like what do we mean by Linux desktop? Is it like uh, first of all the kernel that defines if, if an operating system that like runs Linux kernel is it is it the is every operating system running the Linux kernel on the desktop machine and PC will be the Linux desktop? Or will it be like more of the community like the uh, call system the uh, GNOME and all that free software stuff that goes together and form the desktop environment thing that we know as the Linux desktop, or is it more? Um, do we also mean that the desktop is only on like PCs and laptops, like mobile phones are not Linux desktop, or are they? These questions have to be answered, and uh, I think it, it's kind of hard. And I'm, I'm mostly going with the ecosystem, so it's like more, it's not just a curl, but more the, uh, the ecosystem like GNOME and KDE and XFE all that things. So um, before we get deeper, I wanted to give you some statistics regarding the desktop, like how, where do we stand right now? And it's not, where do we stand right now? And um, it doesn't look good, it doesn't look bad, but we're progressing, right? It's cool. So 56.26% of the whole desktop market share as of 2014 was Windows 7, which is quite big, it's a nice chunk. 
that's where we want to be at least by next year if we were to kind of delay our release that's that and what's interesting is that still we have 18 from 26 percent of windows xp which actually is fire support still 20 percent of the machines are at least vulnerable to all that kind of exploits that windows xp didn't fix or won't fix uh, a slight thing that 13.32 percent is windows 8 which is really interesting a nice jump it's like the newest operating system uh, and, and it really jumped up to 13 percent which is really interesting uh, Mac OS X for all the Mac users, I see at least one person is using Mac. Yeah. Better work. Better work, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, sometimes the loop is not uh, what it is, but 5.26% is Mac OS X, which is a pretty traditional operating system Mac folks. And we have slightly small number, 1.34% of Linux. And uh, we want to widen this blue line, I would say, into a huge. Linux desktop. Oh, you already did that in Sorry? You already did it. You already did it? Yeah, of course. Oh, wow. Yeah, all of us. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, of course. And it's like, yeah, what you were saying is that the Linux desktop, the year of the Linux desktop has already came for people that come in, you know, in the Linux ecosystem. That's true. That's true. Even for me, yeah. The year of the Linux desktop came in 2009 or something. I don't even know. <laughs> Years ago. But we were talking about the masses, right? Majority of the people who are actually using computers. Uh, so distributions that are actually uh, the main drivers of the uh, you know Linux desktop. Linux Mint, which is really interesting. It's only like it's a re relatively young distribution, and it's just uh, and it's just gained the most market share. I didn't find any. Unfortunately, I didn't find any uh, percentages for usage. But these are the five top distributions that are running in desktop. Uh, Mint, about to say the really bad opus is uh, Fedora. Uh, and we're on the fifth position. That's pretty okay. Well, there's a lot of distributions. Um, on the other hand, it's the mobile market, which is still running. Android is based on Linux kernel and on the Linux ecosystem, and it has 84% share of the whole mobile market share. That means we're doing something great on the mobile phone, but we are something kind of, kind of. Uh, not good on the uh, on the PC and stuff, stuff like that. They have like Windows Phone. Like this is like the exact opposite, right? You have Windows, which is like two percent, and you have Android, which Linux or Unix based, uh, having eighty four percent, right? This is the exact opposite of what we have on PCs and laptops. So uh, the question naturally arises: like, um, what can we learn from this, right? Like, why is it that the mobile phones, like Linux, on the mobile phones, is quite popular on Linux? On the PCs and laptops, isn't that all popular, right? Uh, well, the question is the answer is simple. We're doing something wrong, right? Uh, there must be some difference that we're doing on the mobile phone, and there must be so there must be something different that we are what we're doing on the desktop and what we're doing on the mobile phone, right? Uh, one of the problems that I think personally, I think, and then, well, uh, I would say that some people at conferences have told me that they don't like about Linux and desktop in general is the following, like desktop. Environments and I underline S because there are multiple desktop environments. If you know, if you take note, like an Android, uh, there is exactly one UI. Like most of the Androids look the same, right? And you can have a desktop. Like you can have this, which is meant free. Uh, notice how it looks. And then you have, uh, I think it's an Alex. No, this is KDE. You have KDE, which looks quite different. Let's see. Um, we have Alex DE, which is also different from the two, maybe not so much different from KDE. And you have XFC, oh, this is not, this is Mate, and the next one is XFC. So these are all different. And suppose you're a newbie user, like a person who typically uses a desktop computer doesn't, he's not a programmer, he's not somebody who is actually into programming, right? He's not, he don't really care about details of how it works or, or the details of uh, how it should be, right? What they care about is that it, they can use it, it's intuitive, it's easy to use, and it's the same every time. Uh, and uh, uh, the thing is, Android, this, the uh, whole UI looks the same in most of the Android versions. Like, there are some updates, like every other year, there's an update to Android. Like, the current one is Android L, I think. And there are some minor differences between the UI. But if, but if you take for the update from GNOME 2 to GNOME 3, there was a 
huge update, and that was only a single release of an operating system. And when the user updated, suppose it's somebody who cannot, and he doesn't you know how to use it, and it's just the only reason he has a computer is to send emails, right? Which are the, let's be honest, those are the people who we want to be popular with, right? Those are the people who are interested in, who are mostly interested in desktop computers, right? And they don't really, you know, they don't have, they're not intuitive enough to actually find out where it works. So they're going to call somebody to find out, they're going to call me to find them out how it works. And that's, it's really hard to do that when hundreds of people call you to, hey, my computer upgraded, I can't find Google through Chrome anymore. Where is it? And yeah, you have to move your mouse to the top right, top left corner, and you're going to have that. That's like what we ha what would happen from GNOME to GNOME 3. Yeah, so the problem is that they are all, okay, they're, yeah, so they are all different. And, and for us, like for programmers, that's good because we believe in choice. We believe in the freedom of choice and we believe that choice is good. And that's because we can actually work out and we like working by how things work, right? And uh, that is, it's for the, the average user that's not so good, right? So two screens are completely different right now. Yeah, so I can't see anything right now on this screen, apparently. I don't know, so this one's frozen. Cool. This blink just died. Cool. <laughs> so it froze, I don't know, like two slides away, and this is. Um, okay, so, yeah, you can see this is what I'm going to talk about, right? Okay, so the complete. Okay, let me fix it. I don't know how to fix it, but. Hmm. Something happened. Uh, okay, so where was I? Ah, uh, hold on a second. Okay, so now it works. Yeah, so we just experienced the error balloon system. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, so it's good for the people like us who like tinkering with stuff, who like understanding how it works, and who like change, or who people who are you know into things like uh, you know they they embrace change, they want to test it out. You have that urge to you know tinker with it, and then that's good for you. But for an average user, somebody like a grandmother, my like grandmother, she doesn't know how to, how to, you know, when she knows this, this tactic of finding a Google Chrome icon on his desktop, so he moves, his, moves his mouse, moves her mouse up to the, up to the screen, and there's the Google Chrome icon. This is for take for GNOME two. Then it upgraded to GNOME three, and now she has to move her mouse into the top left corner, find out that. Uh, activities thing and then type it to Chromium and then she's lost again so she ends up calling me it takes a couple hours to figure out where it went where how what's the new name and stuff obviously a solution to that is to, to never update the computer but of course you want to update the computer everybody wants to update their computer because new and fresh is new fresh free stuff right uh, but sometimes it just doesn't work right so Another problem with different, uh, okay, so the animation was paused. Okay, whatever, doesn't matter. So, um, yeah, so we can have configuration problems, right? Every different desktop environment has their own configuration application, their own setting applications. Even for me, it's quite difficult to set the time in two machines, because if they have two different desktop environments, because one of them calls them time settings, the other one calls them date and time, and the other one calls it I don't know, clock or something, and you know, it's kind of hard, it takes time, and it's, you know, you have this, the urge to set the time, and, and you have, you don't have it in actions, obviously, and then you just try to figure out where it did go, where it went, yeah, so they even, you, you, it's quite hard to figure out where to set, where, you, where your settings went, and another problem, is the second point here, is that sometimes they have different settings, so Take for example, on KDE you can set something that's you know more advanced, and then on GNOME three you cannot set that. And then you have to figure out how do you actually set that setting to a specified value, the value that you want, right? And I think that's a problem. And even even worse is that two desktop environments do not necessarily share their, share their settings. So if you have your printers, who here has ever had problems with their printers? I never had them working. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, right, so that was like half of the room, right? Um, so sometimes, the, you know, I set my printers on GNOME, and then I boot into KDE, and then I have to redo it, and then it's like, oh, come on, I, I have to figure I have to log back into GNOME to figure out the IP address of my printer, the type of my printer, and then uh, that takes time. Instead, they could just share them. I don't know why they don't share it. I don't know. It's they use the same daemon for it to, pr for it to print, but that's their problem, right? I know. It's weird. So I think this is one of the reasons why people use Macintosh, because that it just works. <laughs> like, you don't have to set anything, it just works, and then it's, it's going to work for a lifetime. I just don't like Macintosh, but that's my opinion. Um, yeah. So this is like one of the problems with Linux desktop that is like you can't configure it. You can configure it, but it's just a little bit impractical. Um, yeah. Okay. So the split screen. I think. Yeah. So distributions uh, is another problem that I believe. Uh, don't get me wrong. I believe in the freedom of choice, and I like being able to choose between Linux distributions. I like running Ubuntu, Fedora, and other stuff simultaneously in my machine even though I love Fedora, right? that's where I'm gonna end up with. Still, for the end user, it's not so good. Like, take for example, somebody actually wants to install Firefox in their machine. Like, they're gonna type in, install Firefox into their, uh, into their browser of choice. Install, they, the thing is, they only know if they are running Linux, because they, that's what they, that's different. That's what differentiates them from Windows users, if they are running Linux. I don't, they not, do not necessarily know that they are running uh, Fedora or the Ubuntu. Um, so they're just going to type into the browser of choice that how to install uh, Firefox on Linux. And they find out how to install it, so they get an RPM package and they are supposedly running Ubuntu. So they try to run the RPM package on Ubuntu because that's the only thing they find. Or, and then they are they're stuck. They have an RPM that they can't run, and they're just gonna say, okay, Linux sucks, I'm going back to Windows. And they do. This happened many, many times to my friends and to people who told me that they found an RPM package for Firefox. Yeah, because they don't, do not know that there's a command line and they don't wanna use the command line because they think it's magic, which it is. And, um, so it's weird, but really the problem is they do, they're not aware of the system they're running and the choice is sometimes not good. Choice is not good when you are a newbie. You, it's, you're more like, you do not want to think of it. You do not actually care about it. It's the primary problem, I think, is that you do not care about the distribution. You just want it to work. And when you find a tutorial for installing, I don't know, say for a game, you're gonna install a game, and then you find an instruction for Fedora, but you're running Ubuntu, so you mess up your computer and you say for the rest, for like the first half of the tutorial, the command line is work, and you're all good, you believe it's good, it's working. You're already met, fed up because you have to type all these comments, even though you can use copy and paste, but whatever. And then magically, in the middle of the tutorial, it just stops working and your machine cannot find that comment. Uh, that's where you block. That's what you don't want to happen when you are just a newbie user. You do not want to debug, you do not want to figure out why it doesn't work or why what, what even happened right super um, yeah next thing uh, the problems with distributions right one of them one of the other problems is that you find a tutorial that's what I was talking about one of the other things is that you find a comment that installs Firefox say we yama install Firefox and you're running running a bonto comment yum not found what are we gonna do Linux sucks I'm switching back to Windows right that's what happens. It truly happens. And another thing that they suppose for some weird reason they they're trying to install proprietary drivers and they need development packages, say. So they find out that for the say for libgpack, the package name for would be libgpack dash dev and they're running Fedora. And it's called Dev L, right? That's how you call it, how you call it. Dev L on Fedora. And what happens is if you type in DNF install libgpack dev something a dev on Fedora and package not found and you stuck again right this also happened this is this is from my experience like this happens to people and they are really fed up with it and they don't really like that and the obvious question is how do I set up my printers like I have one of the distributions it works 
Oh, yeah, distribution doesn't work. I don't know how it works, but that's something that printers are useful if they work. And they don't feel that you are in a hurry. Right. So this was this is a quote by Mikhail de Gaza. I hope I pronounced his name correctly. He's the I think he's the GNOME developer, like the main one. Uh, he is the one who said this, and uh, the force is centralized in the kernel and the set of core libraries are undermined by the distro of the day that held a position of power. And that's because, like, the, re the how you green, the, every distribution is in a race against the others, right? We want to be the best. We, they, they, they suck. We want to be the best, right? And we do everything for that. And now, the, the one of the reasons is how you gain market share is by adopting things that are not compatible with the others. Because if you have the mo most market share and you adopt a new technology that doesn't, that is no longer compatible with other distributions, and what other distributions that are smaller would do is that they adopt to you. And um, that's why the Linux kernel was selected, I think. That you, you have to make sure that your, ma your market share, like, what, like suppose there is a market of distributions, and uh, you have a market share of 60%. And then you, you're running the same kernel with the 40 person. Now what you do is you switch to a new kernel so that your software is not compatible with the others. Now what happens is that 60 percent of the users of the whole distribution market are switched to the new kernel and then the, and then the rest of the 40 person will be forced to either fork away or switch to the new kernel. And most of the time, if you are in the market, you're racing, you want to be the best. And how you become the best is that you have to copy sometimes what you think the the principle in the market share has been doing. And this is what happens. This happens every day in the market. Um, and also, uh, yeah, there are some other uh, problems. Like, actually, right, I think that nobody really cares about the uh, Linux desktop anymore. And that's a serious problem. There is some really interesting thing that is this. That a kernel fully supports 4096 accession to the supercomputer Yet my laptop, not this one, but the other laptop, has my difficulty from returning from sleep. It should be a simpler thing, right? This is quite a nice laptop that has even had Linux installed by default. Yet when I uh, when I fold it away and I try to bring it back, it crashes with kernel panic, and I can't really do anything about it other than trying to debug. But only if I have time, right? And Suppose I'm a super newbie user. I do not know how to view, view the uh, kernel messages by tapping debug, but I can't do anything with the information. And uh, it's just kind of weird. This is some interesting thing that I found. And this is also common, you know, discrepancy between what the kernel can do and what the kernel would do <laughs> or want to do. But yeah, that's Linux Torvalds, by the way, the creator of Linux kernel. Uh, uh, another Small problem uh, with the Linux desktop is the GVO graphics array, uh, the VGA for sure. And um, those are the small uh, cards, small cards that you have in your laptops or PCs that generate graphics for you. And the, the, one of the biggest problems I think is that this is we just missed the it just race moment. When you have got your your new NVIDIA 999 super super awesome VGA card, you plug it in and then it just has the same or even worse uh, uh, frame uh, frame rates. Why is that? Because we just actually missed it. Because it just doesn't work. Because first of all, the kernel doesn't care. The kernel actually dismissed binary compatibility for device drivers for the sake of evolution. But actually, the, the problem is that the kernel guys actually have valid reasons for dismissing uh, binary compatibility. But the, the desktop guys, the ones who were, you know, working on XOR drivers or whatever for their, for their, uh, uh, for interfacing with the VGA card, they just don't have the power. The desktop market share Linux is like 1.3 percent. Does anyone care about it? Like, if you have a if you have a huge market like NVIDIA and AT API has, would you care about one percent? Would you care about that one percent? I don't think you would. And then what happens is that they just. You know, they just don't really care about it now. And the, but they have to care about the kernel, which is like two different things right now. They care about the kernel because the kernel has a huge share in the server space and other spaces. And um, but the desktop, 
you know, we care. Even if the kernel supports VGA hard, it doesn't mean that the desktop also supports it. And yeah, this is the fact. Yeah, the kernel doesn't happen us either. So because of the the binary dismission, it just dismiss the kernel, dismiss the uh, binary compatible device drivers. And that's that's good because of the evolution. It allows for a faster evolution of software. You don't have to be backwards compatible with all the modules from the 2.6 series of the kernel. Um, but it doesn't work that way for the desktop. And the other thing that I would love to have is this uh, software release that we have on Windows, right? That where you can set your GPU speed and then, you know, all that stuff. Did we add a limit? I didn't see. And I didn't <coughs> actually, you know, that's quite a useful thing. That would even fix some problems. This would fast, like, that would facilitate faster debugging as well. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that because we're only, sadly, we're 1% uh, of the market, which is kind of bad, but that's what we have and that's what we have to be happy with, right? Another thing, yes, backwards compatibility. Uh, that's my pet sleeve, I love it. Um, Win32K, which is the ABI of the, uh, of the Windows operating system, is quite stable. The Win 98 applications could can run in Windows 8, which is very interesting, right? That's actually 90 years old of compatibility, which is the same age as I am. So, for how long I have lived, I could just run the same application on my Windows machine. And which, on the Linux side, is the GTK, uh, the GNOME, Git, and Qt for KDE are in backwards compatible. So you, if you have like an application written in GTK 10 years ago, chances are if you recompile it, it won't work. Um, which sucks for uh, making up or keeping old uh, applications. Like, you know, you have that super useful project that was abandoned 10 years ago and that you need for your printers to work. You don't really want to rewrite the whole thing just to make it work, even though I had to once, but whatever. Another thing is the rate of change, uh, like how often the operating systems change and how Linux distributions uh, do change. Windows updates its major version every two and three years, on average, sometimes even more, but that's not the point. And the good thing in that is there are no big changes in that time. So if you have Windows XP, you have the same exact Windows XP feeling when you upgrade to Service Pack 2. Right, you have the same exact UI, same <laughs> software. Nobody, nothing breaks most of the time, right? Uh, but on the other hand, we have to release less versus Linux distros, and for you know they were released quite frequently, and there are big changes in there, like you know changing from GNOME two to GNOME three. And don't get me wrong, I love this. I, this is you know this is great for developers. All right, they they want to have change fast, and they want to change every time. They want to use the newest technology. I mean, the, the change from GNOME 2 to GNOME 3 came up like 10 years of GNOME yeah. 2, so it wasn't like a, a six month switch. No, I know, it's like, <laughs> but still, you know, if, you, if you're not following development, you just upgrade and then the switches. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's whatever. So it's, I think it's like, you know, yeah, maybe GNOME 3 is not the best example, but, but this happens, I have had that. And, um, yeah, uh, what else? Um, I wanted to say something, but I actually forgot. So I'm just gonna skip to the next slide. Uh, that was, uh, but we also have, so no, this is so far it sounded like a rant of the Linux and stuff. I don't wanna make it a rant because I, I actually believe that the, the algorithms and stuff will come. Yeah, so there's gonna be great talk about gaming. Uh, today and uh, we, tomorrow, uh, somewhere in this uh, in this conference, and it's going to be all about uh, gaming. And uh, because on the gaming side, we had some great stuff happen to us. It uh, facilitates the faster development of Linux desktop. Like some of them is like SteamOS. Like you have that machine on your that runs. It's just a basic DBM, and then you can just uh, run games in it. That this, this operating system is specially created for gaming. Um, there are some gaming engines that are turning to. Um, Linux that also is now started supporting Linux by Critac, which is like I don't know how to pronounce it, but Critac, I think, which is the uh, engine behind uh, some great games and uh, 
Unreal Engine, which is a really nice engine where you can just quickly throw the game together. If you have a game that was written on a real machine and it works in Windows, it's going to work most of the time on Linux. And that, that actually facilitates the development of Linux because, uh, you know, gaming actually is good for giving the uh, whole Linux desktop to people who aren't, you know, familiar with programming and stuff. Even on the hardware side, uh, there really there are some interesting uh, improvements I think. One of them is that NVIDIA is compatible with Bumblebee, so which is cool. Like you now you can actually switch use the Optimus technology, so like you have two GPUs in your laptop, uh, and you can switch between the two GPUs depending on the load of the of the small GPU, and that's compatible with the first grade driver. It's cool. And there's some also other improvements of the GPU drivers in, in terms of performance and stabilities, both in the kernels, open source drivers, and both in the uh, pressure drivers as well. And it's good because these things actually facilitate the, develop the, uh, the development of the Linux desktop and how it will eventually become even better, better, and better, which we all have our stake in and do it what we want, right? Um, so now we're approaching the end. Uh, so there's like when it's uh yeah so um, okay it works so when it's our year right so who else thinks this will be the year of the next desktop even though it's always fast like 2015 I I'm trying to be optimistic I still have my hopes high I still believe Linux will be great soon but I think realistically the answer is this if it would work it's not soon right it's there are some problems with Linux desktop and we all hope that it will be fixed as soon as possible. But there will be some other people trying to figure out what happens next. I'm unfortunately not so much into the desktop shit, so I, I don't really work on desktop things anymore. Even though I, I do love to work on a uh, desktop and making it better for people. And I do have some, I do help my friends and my family trying to set up desktop, but that's all I can do right now. So, yeah, it's the end of the talk. If you have any questions for, or if you want to listen, yeah. It's not, yeah, it's what I, uh, that's, that's like one of, it's an interesting point, yeah. right, like, we've, we've reached that peak enough. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I had a slide, like, you have to define what is Linux desktop, right, yeah. it's just not going to come, like, next year, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's like, one of the first, right? Last year. Last year. Yeah. Why, why would you say that? Mm, okay. Okay. Yeah, sure. So yeah, if you are actually feeling, um, I have another s extra slide for you. If you are interested in more problems about the Linux desktop, there is a huge list, like f 500 items or so, that actually list problems with the Linux desktop. Why it doesn't work? Why? Why you know? Why is the current situation as is? And there are some improvements. The list has been decreasing and increasing in items over the years. We'll see what happens, right? So, yeah, thank you. I think. Do we have more time for comments or questions? Sure, we have like ten minutes. So. Okay, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm giving a talk later today about the Linux desktop and Fedora. Yeah. And you know, one of the, the my co -pre co -pre on UNC and X to go, uh, which you know, so it's Fedora and Paul's support for desktop. I'm using that at work, and it's like, you know, you avoid the entire hardware compatibility problems mm -hmm. because if you load it into a server, the cloud resistance. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, 
I'm not going to recommend them in my company. It's like it's important to try to get people in front and start answering the right time for something like company politics and requirements and, report, and you know, corporate. So it's, yeah. you, 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 it's you know, a lot easier to install people that you know, install the convenience for your client that's really not involved in the and it's not really going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, actually, like, you know, like, <laughs> still running Linux in this computer, I mean. Like, another example would be, like, uh, you know, if I were to install, a, you know, Fedora or RHEL on my, you know, work desktop, I would not want to get, like, a port from corporate IT. <laughs> yeah. Example, um, this, this thing where, like, get new to the desktop, you have to require Windows, like, even some web apps developed by a company, like, you know, two months ago, they don't just have <coughs> IE. Are you sure? Is that? The, the, the companies that are, like, developing web apps, Brand new ones, like the modern web frameworks, and they only support IE. IE. Yeah, the, yeah. The remember the minimized cost of their software, Internet Explorer. The, their web development, they're they're making their they're only testing their web applications with Internet Explorer. So it's there's so many like they're trying to replace you know you don't work off of some of the desktop or laptop that work with you know a random amount of problems. Uh, like MP or you know or Minefield. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Minefield. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the latency thing, you know, and stuff. I, I never actually did that, but I might actually try it. Give it a try. I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, I can tell you, like, I've talked to a lot of people who have like, smaller tech companies, and they're like, that can't work. You know, like, you want to replace, like, the OS on your laptop with your desktop is no problem. But <laughs> at large enterprises, yeah. there's so many hurdles to taking the issue yeah. of uh, the replacing your OS. Yeah, It's a waste of time, I think. Yeah? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah. What do you think are the prospects for Chrome OS? Chrome OS? Um, well, basically, my problem uh, is that I'm a developer. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't use it because I'm trying to just work, right? So one of the, I think one of the problems with Linux desktop is that it tries to be better for everybody. So what I, what I really adore about Fedora is that we actually have a targeted audience now for Fedora Workstation and other developers. And the Workstation project now is really suited for developers. I love it. And you know, like, you, I, think, I think one of the problems with the desktop in general is that you can't be good for everybody. And there's no such thing as a Linux desktop. It's, it's a Linux desktop for programmers, Linux desktop for gamers, and stuff like that. That's that's what I think about Chrome. Chrome is good if you want to read emails or use Facebook and all that stuff. Right? It's good for new being to that user, right? That's what I think, right? Somebody has it here. Yeah, you have it. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, my comment would be that there's a number of things that pop up in terms of topics that you know that I mean, there is really no Linux desktop, right? And I think in terms of the things around the one thing that we really should have almost gotten right is that they stopped all this stuff using Linux because they realized that there is really no Linux because when you scale everything. You get all these problems. So yeah, problems like, oh yeah, the only desktop is mm -hmm. not. But the reality is, like, you know, let's say Fedora Workstation or, or Ubuntu or Steam OS. I mean, they are a very independent thing. And, and, and in some sense, the fact that we keep talking about them, that they're all basically the same, mm -hmm. creates a lot of issues because people then expect that, hey, I can, you know, yeah. switch between 10 desktops and expect them to all work the same. That's yeah, yeah, that's one of the problems. Yeah. The common name, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, in some sense, I mean, a lot of the problems we miss, right? So, there's no way to stop calling the Linux desktop and say that actually, you know, what we're talking about here is like yeah. Fedora Workstation. Right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Do you think the logical between the mobile providing software tools and Fedora and Fedora? That's a good question. Um, I haven't actually <coughs> thought about that before. 
I, I don't know for sure. I have to think about that before I ask. <laughs> yeah? Um, yeah. This is what I can tell you right now that the, the canonical is one of the last things they didn't do desktop and desktop release. Um, it's the units that they're going to migrate, like the, 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 the like Ubuntu desktop release is like Meteor and Bluegrass Next. But in the meantime, it's like we're making hardly new improvements. Um, so that's one last thing. Um, I think that, that's one of the reasons why the mint thing has grown that yeah, much. Yeah, because we have more stuff that might be new too. But I think I was going to say, you know, you mentioned all those, like the, the fact that they want to change the setting, right? With like, yeah. uh, like the little floats, the lit, the suspend my laptop. Yeah, lot suspend, yeah. Right. So, you know, all the, you know, the cross desktop environment compatibility and operability stuff is, you know, defined within like, you know, uh, freedesktop.org. Their acronym is still XDD, uh, just desktop group. And so they're placing like, they have a bunch of settings for local resources, uh, local resources and all that's fine, but the proxy setting is defined within a, a new setting. And every desktop environment, every environment that's like yeah. these that the web proxy setting. So they do have some settings, but I think they need a lot more to be defined. So that's a simple thing. Another example is, you know, like a screen saver and stuff, like time mm -hmm. pass time, that's, that's another thing. Yeah. Like this is this is what I was talking about. Like everybody is in a race with each other right now. They, well, I mean, this, is like, this is like from like desktop environments, not distros, you know. And I mean, no, like no one KDE have worked you know very well, and everything like they said, well, the free desktop they're going to have. So. Yeah, it's like you know, I think I think it's part of the race. Like it's we we we're not working together. <laughs> I don't. I feel like there's a race between this group, but not. And it's yeah. like. Not, 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 yeah. Definitely yeah, that's, that. that's, that's, yeah, that's fair. Oh, well, yeah, there you go. You should work together, right? Work closer and stuff, but the market is not the way it is. Mm -hmm. Huh? You have one? You can listen to Peril. I, I think I, you can listen to Peril, but you. Really? Yeah. But I, mean, the, the I, I don't think that ever worked for me. <laughs> no, but the, 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 the problem oh. with DPK or DPK is not necessarily the fact that, once again, this is all by the way, this is this whole picture of, you know, what, what is part of the application also is an API that consists of lots of things, including yeah. DPK and Swift. And it doesn't, of course, help you if you have, you know, correct version of DPK or Swift installed, it might be a really thin version change or a text version change, whatever. Um, so it's, uh, so the problem is, I mean, the problem is not, you know, DPK and Swift lacking backwards compatibility because they always work fine with uh, Perl installed or with, you know, it's, it's a moving platform with heavy dependencies. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, uh, I mean, I guess it took two time to work on there for this to come out that there's a new model of, of doing uh, an application running in a library rather than yeah. and compatible yeah. with applications with a main source and where you switch. Yeah, that was the first, yeah, yeah. Um, I believe in that. Yeah. I love that, yeah. I mean, I, I'm very optimistic that I can make some of these applications. Um, Me too. I'm like, trying to deal with this basically uh, two approaches that people take to getting software. The Windows uh, desktop approach is go to the software program websites, you yeah. know, Mozilla.org or yeah, yeah. Adobe, Adobe.com for those of you there. The, the mobile approach is there from the App Store. <laughs> so it's harder for Linux to inform to that performance standard, but Linux standard, you know, we have, we have software standard issues with, you know, yeah, uh, with the DNS. So I feel like that we're going to have fewer problems with people downloading random RPMs or devs thanks to the mobile OS and the software, uh, software extension. Yeah, yeah, but, okay. but I do think we do need, there's all these there are features planned for Mint software depending on all yeah, the Yeah, but the reason I came up with this Firefox example is yeah. that people coming over from Windows are used to having their Google download yeah. apps and RPMs from the website. Yeah, and then it'll be really Which easy nowadays if they have Android or iOS. Yeah. I'm not sure I really have to do my life, but um, really quick example, um, an Egyptian classroom, you know, so I, I had a Wacom tablet and I bought it and I set it up and my stuff said, well, it's going to be one of those ones you're going to have to work and it said, yeah, you've got this Wacom tablet, it actually even said it was Windows 10 and it just worked. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to take it into the classroom and we've got Windows 10 in this classroom. So I plugged it in to the machine so I went, click, didn't find it. Okay, this is USB, we'll go get it, sorry. Then it goes, doesn't know what it is. So then we had to go on and we had to Google and we had to actually get the drive and we had to download the 200 megabyte drive of file and everything else. And <laughs> I find 
kind of like, so I've got, I, I've always said he was quite substantial to my mother, but it is my mother that I'm suing because I've got my mother using um, Sedora. And the reason I got her on that was because she was having so much trouble editing one of the download drivers and everything else. So it's actually easier for me to say, Mum, like just do DNS and install this, mm -hmm. or go to the software center and have, and she likes playing little games, go to the software yeah. center and look at that. And I think that we need to do a lot of education and I'm going to Victoria and the team down there to be able to do that to show them actually this is a really it's a lot easier model. This is how you this is how you should model. use it, right? Yeah. Actually and it follows the model of and maybe that's a good point, is if we can tie it into the app yeah. store model for people as well, like just how you go and you download your Play Store app or whatever you want, you can download a software center app. Mm -hmm. We have to actually do for the for it to so we can try to follow these stuff like a known desktop. And also make sure we get like known kids have to be known. Yeah, and that's yeah, we should put it Maybe we should have yeah. like Fedora extensions like here's how to install software on Fedora yeah. Software Center. Like Alex can take you down the road of this and then we'll link it. Yeah. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Another one oh, okay. Sorry. 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 Switch it out there. Visual guide or yes. much visual screenshots that you can show I mean, people who hear this. Really cool thing that that in the old time, time cool. Was that? Oh, I was just going to say, you have yeah. So yeah, thank you for coming. I'm sorry.